Praise the Lord. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, that is written, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. For the love of money is the root of all evil. How many professing Christians can quote that part of the scripture? And how many professing Christians believe that this scripture is in reference to those in the world? And yes, it is true. The love of money is the root of all evil for those in the world as well. And we can see many examples in the world of what the love of money causes people to do. However, that's not the point of this sermon. This sermon is this scripture in its entirety as it is written, for the love of money is rid of all evil, colon, which while some covet after, coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. They have erred from the faith. Not only is this scripture applicable to those in the world, this is written directly to Christians. This scripture is written as a warning to those who are born again. A warning for Christians to take heed. For in the following verse of verse 11 it is written, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. What things? The love of money coveting after money. The Word of God commands us men of God to flee these things. Why? Because the love of money is the root of all evil and coveting after money has caused some to err from the faith. Jesus Christ gives to us a warning. In Luke chapter 18, we see the signs of the times. We know that Christ is coming again. No man knows the day or the hour that he cometh again. Christ says it's not for us to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But Christ has given to us signs that we're seeing being fulfilled today, knowing that his coming is even at the door. That we're living in the last days and Christ says when he comes again in Luke chapter 8, verse 8, Luke chapter 18, verse 8, Christ says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. When Christ comes again, he is not looking for church attendance. When Christ comes again, He's not looking to those who sing songs of his praise. When Christ comes again, he is seeking for faith. For Christ says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. This is a warning to us in these last days that there is going to be a lack of faith. Throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Christ continued to rebuke his disciples for unbelief, for lack of faith. And throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Christ continues to commend those that had great faith. Even some were not even Jews, such as the Roman centurion, in which Christ says, how great his faith was and commended him for his faith and honored his faith by healing his servant who is sick nigh unto death. Faith pleases God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, For without faith it is impossible to please him, God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith pleases God. When Christ walked this earth, he rebuked his disciples for lack of faith, for unbelief, and he commended those that some were not even Jews for their great faith that they had and honored their faith 
in answering their prayers and granting to them their heart's desires. And Christ warns us in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. There are many that profess to be Christians, but they have erred from the faith. Why is that? They have coveted after money. Though the love of money is the root of all evil, their desire is for money. Their prayer is for money. They covet after money, and the Word of God warns us it has caused them to err from the faith. For in the book of James, chapter 2, it is written under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 5, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? Who has God chosen to be rich in faith? The poor of this world. Who does the word of God warns us that would err from the faith? Those coveting after money. And what does Christ say he's coming again for? What is he looking for? Shall the Son of Man find faith on the earth? If a Christian covets after money, if a Christian lives for money, if a Christian's desire is for money and sees that money is the answer to their problems, they will err from the faith. For God had chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. God hath chosen the poor of this world. No wonder with this in mind, when we read the book of Acts, we see the early church, the disciples of Jesus Christ, the first Christians, selling their lands, selling their houses, and giving it away to the poor. For God has chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith. No wonder we see throughout the Gospels, Christ warns the rich. How hardly shall they that have riches enter in to the kingdom of God. Christ says that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter in to the kingdom of God. No wonder throughout the Gospels we see Christ warn those to sell all that they have, to give to the poor, and then to take up their cross and follow him. For God had chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and God's word warns us that as those that covet after money, some have erred from the faith. And today we see this true in these last days we're living in. Many that profess to be Christians, many that profess to be born again, are weak in the faith. They don't have the faith to cast out devils. Though Christ says, And these signs shall follow them that believe, and my name shall they cast out devils. They don't even have testimonies of casting out devils. In this devil-possessed world we're living in, people are possessed with devils and committing murder and murdering on a mass scale. Yet where are the Christians? In this devil possessed world we're living in, where so many are full of the devil everywhere we go. Yet where are the Christians? Why aren't they casting out those devils? And why is it so many Christians we meet? They have no testimonies of casting out devils in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, though they profess to believe. Here in this country that I'm currently living in, of Thailand, the majority of the population are animists slash Buddhist slash Brahmin Hindus. 94% of the population here mix Hinduism with Buddhism with animism. And many profess that animism is the foundation of their religion. Animism is the worship of spirits, or which the Bible calls devils. 
And here in a country where over 94% of the population are worshiping devils openly, Christians should have a testimony of casting out devils in the name of Christ on a consistent basis when Christ says in Mark 16, verse 17, and these such will then they believe, and my name shall they cast out devils. Yet I met many who profess to be Christians, who profess to believe, who profess to be born again, don't have any testimonies of casting out devils out of others that need it so much so in this country we're living in in this devil-possessed world we're living in. Why is that? There's a lack of faith in the church today. Many err from the faith, for they covet after money. And the Bible warns us that when some have coveted after money, they have erred from the faith. The Word of God clearly teaches us that God has chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith. And it takes faith to cast out devils, as Christ says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. How many in this day we're living in that profess to be Christians, that profess to believe, that profess to be born again, don't even have faith to heal the sick. Though Christ says in Mark chapter 16, verse 18, they that believe shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Yet many that profess to be Christians today have no testimonies of laying hands upon the sick and the sick recovering. This world we're living in is sick. There's so many pestilences and diseases everywhere. Yet where are the Christians. Christ says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Why are not Christians doing so today? Because many have erred from the faith. God has chosen the poor of this world rich in faith. Yet throughout the world those who profess to be Christians whether they're rich or poor are coveting after money. Are praying for money, are desiring money, are seeing money as the answer to all their problems and living for money, though Christ says you cannot serve God and mammon. And because of this, they err from the faith. They do not have the power, the faith, to heal the sick. They don't have the power, the faith, to cast out devils. And very few, sad to say this they were living in, have no testimonies of raising the dead. Though Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today, and forever, and Christ has given to us his promise in John chapter 14, verse 14, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Yet very few today have testimonies of ever raising the dead. So we that are Christians, we must choose. Choose you this day who you will serve. Christ says ye cannot serve God and mammon. We must choose to serve the Lord and reject mammon. As the word of God commands us, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. The love of money coveting after money. Flee these things that you err not in the faith. And as a testament to this, which I've testified before about in previous sermons, as an example of this, of the remedy of this last day we're living in for those of us that are Christians to serve God in that mammon. Years ago, as I'm an evangelist, God has gifted and called me to do the work of evangelists. I was asked and invited to preach at a church here in Bangkok, Thailand, that had rich church members. At that time, I was in favor with the many churches throughout Bangkok, Thailand. At this time, I'm out of favor with many of them for preaching God's word. But at that time, years ago, many churches I was in favor with, and they'd invite me to preach at their church. Of course, churches here in Bangkok, Thailand will give you a good offering. 
and some of those rich church members, if their ears got tickled, they would give you an extra offering as well. Of course, throughout the years, the offering stopped, and they stopped inviting me altogether, and now have practically banned me at the door. But a few years ago, they would invite me to preach at these churches. At the same time, on the Thai-Burmese border, a Filipina missionary called and invited me to come preach at her orphanage. She was discouraged, she was going through some hard times, and she was worried about those orphans, and she wanted them to hear God's word and to see an example of a man of God who lives by faith and asked me if I would travel to the Thai Burmese border to preach at her orphanage. Of course, they had no blessings to give to me, no money to be involved. I have to pay my own way there and pay my own way back. Of course, there's no money involved, but if I preach at the Bangkok church, there'd be a big blessing involved. So as I went to the Lord of prayer, of course, the God of the Bible, who tells us he cannot serve God and mammon, who warns us about the love of money and commands us to flee these things, of course, the Lord would send me to the Thai Burmese border and not that church here in Bangkok, Thailand. Yes, at that time, we could have used those blessings. At that time, we could have used that money. But we don't serve mammon. We serve God. For you cannot serve God and mammon. And God would have me to do the opposite of what mammon would have me to do. If you desire not to err from the faith, you've got to flee. Flee from these things. Flee from the love of money. Flee from coveting after money. Flee from money. For how hardly should they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. God had chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which is promised to them that love him. To travel to that orphanage there on the Thai Burmese border. And to take a bus from Bangkok to an area called Kanchanaburi. Of course, I was able to, not able to take the VIP bus. I took the normal bus and left early in the morning, stopped at every bus stop imaginable, and took a very long ways to get to Kanchanaburi. And Kanchanaburi then had aboard another bus, a non-air-conditioned bus that was very old that would take me to the Thai-Burmese border. It took practically all day to get to the border town of Sanklaburi and Kanchanaburi here in Thailand. When I got to the town of Sanklaburi, the bus, a pickup truck that it can carry passengers to the village where the orphanage was at, was not leaving for another hour. After traveling all day, of course, I had not eaten that day. Yes, we believe in fasting, and we also believe in living a fasted life. To serve the Lord sometimes, you have to go without meals involuntarily. I didn't have the money nor the time to eat on the way there to Kanchanaburi, on the way to St. Clabri, but now I had one hour. And in that hour's time, I could find something to eat. As I began, bought my ticket on the bot bus, told me back in an hour, walked towards the market, trying to find some food to eat. I realized I'm only here in this town for one hour. This is not the time to eat. This is the time to preach the gospel. Yes, my flesh was weary from traveling all day. Yes, I was hungry and had the hunger pains. But I was only in that town for one hour. That's only one hour to preach the gospel. Therefore, instead of looking for food, I began looking for a place and a people to preach the gospel to. As I walked throughout the market, because most people are busy in the merchandising, buying and selling, I did not find a place to preach to, nor a people to preach to. So I continued to walk through that market until I found outside the market on the other side, waiting on the side of the road, was a group of Buddhist monks. Now I had found the people to preach to. I had traveled all day on an air conditioned bus. I was sweaty, I was dirty, and in this dusty country, I was dusty as well. I was carrying my duffel bag over my shoulder, which was also dirty and dusty from the trip. I walked to the group of Buddhist monks, and I found the eldest one there, who was the leader of that group, 
and asked him in the Thai tongue if I stole something and became a Buddhist monk, would that help me and save me from going to hell? He answered to me and said, if you stole something, you need to go to jail, you need to replace it. Being a Buddhist monk won't help you. No, you gotta, if you stole, if you're a thief, you need to give those things back and begin rebuking me. He forgot that I said, if, in that question, he jumped to conclusions. And then I said to him as he was yelling at me, and with a Buddhist monk yelling at me, it caused a small crowd to gather around. People saw the duffel bag in one hand, the Bible in the other, and here this Buddhist monk was yelling at this Christian. I then asked the Buddhist monk if I've murdered somebody and then became a Buddhist monk, would that save me from going to hell? To say that he got very angry at me is an understatement. He began yelling at me, who are you? Where did you come from? Look at me from head to toe. Who did you steal? Who did you murder? He forgot I said if. As he was yelling and threatening me, came at me, mad at me as if I was a murderer, if I was a thief, and with a self-righteous religious hatred towards me, was taking his vengeance out on me, I then asked him, and what if someone tells a lie? Will becoming a Buddhist monk save them from hell? He started backing down. Then I asked him, have you ever told a lie in your life? And when you die, where will you go? And then began preaching from the word of God. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. For it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. He backed down from me and I began warning them about the judgment of God. Once again, when he yelled at me, a small crowd gathered around us. That crowd drew an even larger crowd, and now the crowd was watching me preach that older Buddhist monk. And he had nothing to say as I preached to him about the judgment of God and how only Jesus Christ saves. As it is written, neither is there salvation than any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, preaching the gospel of Christ unto those Buddhist monks. As I can to preach the gospel of Christ to them, the truck they are waiting for showed up on the scene. The reason they're on the side of the road was they're waiting for a truck to pick them up and take them back to the Buddhist temple they came from. And when the truck showed up on the, on the scene and they start getting in the truck one by one, I continued to preach to them until the truck, truck drove off. When the truck drove off, the crowds began leaving one by one. And then a Burmese man, as we were on the Thai-Burmese border, started looking at me saying, you just preached to a monk. And then he squatted down on the ground, almost pulling his hair off his head, got back up, a monk, you were preaching to a monk. It was in shock of this. When he found out, when he, I found out he could speak in Thai, we began conversing in the Thai tongue and come to find out. He was the pastor of a local church there in San Clabri, which is made up of mostly Burmese people on the Thai-Burmese border. And he began begging me in the Thai tongue if this Lord's Day, the coming Lord's Day, I would preach at his church. And he said to me in the Thai tongue, they needed this that I had. What did I have? The faith in the gospel the faith in the gospel that would cause me to preach the gospel unto every creature, whether they be Buddhist monks or normal people, as is written, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I explained to that Burmese pastor that that Lord's Day I was supposed to preach in this certain village at an orphanage. He says to me, that's just children, as if children were not important. No, the Bible says to train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. 
It is important that children get trained in the gospel and see examples of us who live the gospel. Children are important for children are the future. Yet this Burmese pastor said, those are just children. You need to preach at our church. We've got so many members. We've got the largest church in the area. Come see my church. He got on his motorbike, told me to get in the back of it, and we drove to his, he drove me to his church building, which was very large. He says, now you know where the church building is. Come here this Sunday. I said, once again, I've got to keep my promise. I'm preaching in an orphanage this Lord's Day. Maybe some other time I'll come back and preach here. He said, okay, how about this? He said, we're going to begin our church service at 1030. We're going to sing for about an hour. If you can get here by 1130, you can preach at the pulpit. He said, when you go to the other church there in the village, have them let you preach first and let them sing at the end. And then you can come here while we're singing, and then you can come and preach when we finish singing. I said, that's the deal. That's the plan. Shook his hand on that. He gave me a ride back to where the bot buses were as my hour was just about up, and the bot bus was getting ready to leave. As I got into that bot bus, another man saw my Bible. I began preaching the people on that bot bus and introduced himself to me as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I let that Seventh-day Adventist pastor know I'm an everyday Adventist. We did not say the word Adventist in the Thai tongue and call himself a Seventh-day Christian. And I answer back in the Thai tongue, I'm an everyday Christian. So it makes more sense in the Thai tongue. When I said that to him, he took that as a rebuke and stopped talking to me. And I came to preach to all the others there on that bot bus from the Sankabri to the Hoi Malai village where that orphanage was. The Filipino who ran the Filipina who ran that orphanage told me that if I told the bot bus driver about going to her, her orphanage, he would know where it is and would know where to let me off so I can go to her orphanage. When I asked the bot bus driver if he knew it, he said he did. And I asked him to tell me when we got there to let me know where to get off at. When we got to the village, that bot bus driver had no idea where the orphanage was had no idea there was even a Christian orphanage in the village and let me off at another place. When I asked him where the orphanage was, he said he did not know, and now I could not argue with him. You see, for us Christians, Christ tells us, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. But for people of other religions, they don't have such a commandment. And their yea is not yea, and their nay is not nay. When asked if he knew that orphanage, he said he did. But in fact, he did not. No conviction whatsoever to lie to me so I get in his bot bus and he makes some money off of me. He didn't take no responsibility for his words, for that man is not a Christian. Therefore, I couldn't get angry with him. So as I was stuck in the middle of this village, had no idea where I was going, the Seventh-day Adventist pastor got up. And he told me he knows where the orphanage is. He said, we pass a long ways back, and it's too far to walk to. If I would come with him to his son's house, he said, he would borrow his son's motorbike and then drive me to that orphanage. Now, he could have spoke up at the very beginning. He knew where I was going as he heard me ask the bot bus driver about the orphanage. He could have told me when we passed the road where the orphanage was, need to get off here, but he did not. Until now, we had to go to his house, his son's house together. We arrived to his son's house, they had me sit outside. He went to talk to his son. They gave me a glass of water. And as they talked in the local Karen tribal tongue, I knew they were talking about me, though I do not understand their language. Well, how do I know they're talking about me? Because they would talk together and then look at me and then keep talking together and keep looking at me. So I didn't want to look at them. I drank my water, looking out in the road, the dirt road the house is located on, and I saw a Karen man walking down the road. Now I know about two words in the Karen tongue. Dablu means thank you when you shake somebody's hand, and ochua means how are you. Now I didn't say dablu to him because I didn't shake his hand. So the only word I knew to say was ochua means how are you. Well, he was very stressed out. He was one with his head down when I said to him, Ochua, which means, how are you? He came straight to me and told me in broken Thai, his son is in the hospital. They're going to operate on him because he has not urinated for three days. 
I'm a man who likes to stay hydrated. I drink lots of water a day. Every morning I drink 1.5 liters of water. That is a big bottle of water or four large cups of water, eight measuring cups. I like to stay hydrated. One of the scariest things to me about hell is not the flames. That's scary enough, but there's no water in hell. When I read as Christ tells us about that rich man in hell, he was in tormentation because he just wanted a drop of water on his tongue. That scares the hell out of me. I like to stay hydrated. And so as I'm a man who likes to stay hydrated, I'm also a man of many urinations. I urine often throughout the day. Whenever I travel on a bus that has a toilet on it, people will complain and think that I have a diarrhea or something because they see me going to the toilet quite often. No, oh, nothing wrong with my stomach. That's just me. I drink a lot of water today. I've got to use the bathroom quite often. When I take those non-air conditioned buses, I'm the guy who has to ask the bus driver, can you stop here a second? I got to jump out and use the bathroom. I'm a person who uses the bathroom quite often because I stay hydrated. So I know what it's like to not use the bathroom sometimes, get to hold it just for a few minutes or a few hours. Here this man told me his son had not urinated for three days. That hurts a man like me to hear such a thing. That caused me to feel pain where I don't want to feel pain when I hear something like that. When I get over the shock of him saying that, he then told me the Thai tongue that they're going to castrate his son. I thought, that's not right. No, no, do not castrate your son. I said, I'll go with you to the hospital right now. I'll pray for your son, and he won't have to get castrated. Oh, he got a smile on his face then. He said, really? I guarantee gospel truth, Bible truth. Christ says, we shall lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. I promise you, you're not going to castrate your son today. We're going to go there and pray for him. Well, he got excited. When the Seventh-day Adventist pastor came out to take me to the orphanage, we both were excited now, and I told that pastor, I'm not going to the orphanage now. Take us to the hospital. I'm going to pray for this man's son. The Seventh-day Adventist pastor was not happy about that. He stared at that man real mean. Then he stared at me, but he couldn't reject what I was saying. So we all three got on this, on this small little scooter to go to the hospital on a bumpy dirt road. Because I'm a large man, a heavyweight, I weigh over 220 pounds, very large man. I'm not made for these scooters even by myself, but I was with two other men as well. And the tires were almost flat as we're going there. And that Seventh day Adventist pastor was complaining the Karen tongue, looking at his tire, and then looking at me, the large man on the motorbike. Now, I do not know what he was saying, but I could guess he was complaining about me and how big I was. We got to the hospital. It was a, a room where all the patients are in one big room, a village hospital. As we walked to the bed where that man's son was, there was a IV tube going down into his pants and urine was coming up out of that. That looked very painful to me. As we're walking to his bed to pray for him, it took me a little bit longer than those other two men because I was actually in pain seeing such a thing. We got to the young boy, he was sleeping, had that tube going down into his pants. Urine was coming up in the tube. It was not a nice sight to see. As I went to pray for him and lay hands on his head, praise God for the Holy Ghost. God gives gifts unto men. There are gifts of the Spirit God gives to us. And one of those gifts are the word of knowledge. When I went to lay hands on that sick boy, thinking they're going to castrate him, thinking this is a very bad thing. It was so bad, it was making me hurt. When I went to lay hands upon him, when my hand touched his head, and that's why we believe in what the Bible says, laying hands on others. When my hand touched his head, the Lord gave me a word of knowledge that he was not going to be castrated. He was going to be circumcised. I immediately stopped. I looked at the young boy's father and said, they're not going to castrate your son. They're going to circumcise him. He had no idea what I was talking about. I called the nurse over, a Thai nurse, 
and had her explain to him in Thai they weren't going to castrate his son. She began yelling at him, saying to the Thai tongue, we've been trying to tell him this, screaming at him, we're not going to cast, we're going to circumcise. So then I had to explain to him with sign language what circumcision was, and the foreskin of his son had gone over, which happens to people that are uncircumcised, and all they do is just cut that foreskin off. He still was confused about that. Then I let him know that I was circumcised, because the country I come from, United States of America, they circumcise you for fun. I don't know why they circumcised you before, but they did it. It's no problem at all. He'll be healed in a few days, and because I was circumcised, I know we even circumcised my son. It's no problem at all. It don't hurt him at all. No, it's just going to hurt for a few days. He'll recover and be fine and still remain a male. He's not going to be castrated. And then the nurse explained that an American doctor was there volunteering at the hospital and was going to perform the circumcision. And I asked her what was the doctor's name. And just as I suspected, it was a Jewish doctor because of the last name, I knew he was Jewish. So then I told that man, you've got the best of the best. A Jewish doctor going to circumcise your son. They do it the best because they're committed. They're the ones who brought it into the world. Circumcision. God gave them the command to circumcise their sons. Well, he still wasn't sure what I was saying, but he saw me smiling, the nurse smiling. He knew whatever I was saying must be true, and he got happy. So then I just prayed for that boy to have a successful circumcision, and they're just waiting for the doctor to be free and to be done within an hour. Praise the Lord. While this was going on, I could hear a Buddhist monk screaming out in pain from his bed in that room. It was a large room, but I could hear him screaming in pain. While we're having this discussion going on about circumcision and things such as this, I couldn't help but keep looking where the Buddhist monk was as he was screaming in pain as if he was dying. So when we finished with this bed, I walked over to that Buddhist monk's bed and said to him, in the Thai tongue, if you invite me, I will pray for you. He then made hand motions as he was screaming in pain. And made hand motion. I said, no, you've got to invite me with your mouth, with the words of your mouth. He said, come, come. I went to his bedside, laid hands upon him, which in Thailand is illegal to touch a Buddhist monk's head, but we had to do so according to the Bible. Laid hands upon him, and as I prayed the prayer of faith, he fell asleep. Praise God, that's what he needed, because he stopped screaming. When he fell asleep, and I opened my eyes to pray for him, I saw the peace on his face knowing that he was recovering for whatever he was afflicted with. And as I was looking at this as a miracle, praising God to witness such a miracle there on the border, I lifted my head up and the whole hospital room full of people were all now looking at me. In these hospitals in Thailand, they have the family come to help do the nursing because there's not enough nurses here. So the family members have to be there at the bedside of those that are sick. So not only all the beds filled up, there was all kinds of family members there as well. And they all were now looking at me with my hand on this Buddhist monk's head. Because they have family members next to the bedside, they'll have chairs for the family members to sit in, mostly plastic, cheap chairs. But because this was a Buddhist monk, they had a metal stool sitting next to his bed. So I grabbed that metal stool, put it in the middle of the hospital floor, jumped up on it, and began preaching the gospel of Christ unto all in that hospital room as I had their attention. And they all listened, except for one man, the seventh day Adventist pastor, he took off running out the hospital door. In fact, he ran so fast, he probably didn't even need a door. He could have ran through the wall. He was running so fast. I preached the gospel. When I finished preaching the gospel to this group, I then asked them, if anybody wants prayer, I'll pray for each and every one. And they all asked for prayer. So I went from bed to bed praying for different ones and the hospital was full so i prayed for quite a few people in that hospital room while i was praying for different people on the hospital beds i'd witness seven day Adventist pastor come in the hospital door and run back out again not only was i preaching i was now praying for everybody praise the lord after praying for everybody in the hospital room went outside not knowing where i'd go where i'd stay maybe i stay in the hospital now there was that seventh day Adventist pastor waiting for me on the back of that motorbike. 
I have no idea what happened to that one boy's father. He disappeared. So I got in the back of that motorbike. We went to the orphanage. Now it was late in the evening. It was already dark. As we got off at the entrance of the orphanage, this man walked up there with me, though he was uninvited. When we got to the orphanage and introduced myself to the Filipina and the different orphans, the Seventh-day Adventist pastor sat down next to me. When we got through all the introductions and talking, he then asked me, as that was a Friday evening, if tomorrow I would go to his church and preach exactly what I preach at that hospital, the gospel and do what I did the hospital, pray for the sick. He said most of the members of his church are all sick. And if I would go with him to the church and preach what I just preached, the gospel, he would take me around the whole village where his church is to pray for the sick. I said, that's a deal. Praise God, because like I told him before, I'm an everyday Christian. First day of the week, or seventh day of the week, I'm preaching and praying nonetheless. Praise God that Saturday morning he picked me up. We went to his, where his church was, a small little village hut, I guess you would call it. I preached the gospel, which they had not heard, as there are Seventh-day Adventists, Sabbath keepers, keeping the law of Moses. So I preached the gospel of Christ to them, which they had never heard before. After preaching the gospel of Christ to them, we then went around all over the village, praying for the sick all day came back to the orphanage that, that evening on Saturday, and then preached those orphans and gave them testimonies of what we just witnessed, praise God. In fact, it was Saturday afternoon. After that, I took the orphans to get a little bite to eat as they had some cheap noodles down the road from the orphanage. As we're getting a bite to eat, there were some issues that came up with what the owner of the noodle stand and one of the orphans, and so I had to be a peacemaker, and because I did so, I think she tried to poison me, as she had a certain bowl she wanted to give to me especially. I didn't eat the bowl, and then I went back to that hospital to pray for the sick on Saturday evening. I was excited. I was really excited. I'd been praying all day that Saturday at that one village. I had prayed the night before at that hospital. All day Saturday, I'd been praying for different people at that one village, and now I was back at the hospital, ready to pray some more, walked in the door, and it was empty, except for some janitors cleaning the empty beds. I was confused. When I first walked into the hospital, there was a little boy who was wobbling and came wobbling to me. Of course, I love children, so I picked him up. <laughs> I thought he wanted a hug. And then the father the child came to me crying in broken tie, telling me, he's healed, he's healed, he's walking. I didn't know what he's talking about, of course, children walking. Oh, he's healed. He was crippled the day before. The doctor said he'd never walk again. And there he was the next day walking. And his earthly father was giving glory to God. As he knew is because of the prayer I prayed the day before. Christ says, these signs of all them that believe. In my name they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. This was a miracle. That earthly father's crying. I'm crying. The little boy's laughing. We're all having a great time. I went to the hospital around to pray for the sick, and it was empty, like I said before. Nobody's there except for the janitors. I went to the nurse station to find the nurse and asked her, where are all the patients? Where have you moved them to? Where are they hiding at? What happened to them all? And she said to me, preacher, don't you remember? You prayed for them yesterday. They're all healed. They've all left. How can that be? Because we don't serve mammon. We serve God. We don't covet after riches. That calls you to err from the faith. No, we desire to be the poor of this world, living by faith, that we may be rich in faith. Money is not the answer. Faith is. Because with faith, you can do the impossible. You'd have all the money in the world. You're not going to empty any hospitals. But if you've got faith in God, mountain moving faith, you can empty hospital rooms out. Praise the Lord. That Lord's Day, I preached at the orphanage. The Filipino who ran the orphanage was very scared and worried for me because that village 
on Sundays, they had no transportation, no bot buses. She said there was no way for me to get into town. She couldn't drive me to town. There was no way for me to get there. I was stuck there. Had to wait till Monday morning, she said, for the bot buses. I said, no, I promised that pastor in San Calabria I'd be there. So I preached. Then that Filipino walked with me to the road. As we got to the main dirt road, she said, see? And it was empty. There's no vehicles. And she told me, I told you, you gotta wait till Monday morning. There's no vehicles, no bot buses on Sundays. There's no transportation from the village to the town on Sundays. You've gotta stay here tonight. You're not gonna have any, there's no vehicles. I just smiled at her. Why? I prayed that morning. I had woken up a great while before his yet day. Jesus Christ says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and this righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. I knew there'd be a transportation for me. Had no shadow of a doubt about it, because God keeps his word. As she was telling me all this, and I was smiling at her, because she lacked faith. Though she may not have money, she was coveting after money. She had told me her desire to open a big mega church. She was looking for supporters and sponsors and asking people through the internet to send her money to build a mega church. She wasn't rich in faith, though she was poor, because she coveted after money, causing her to err from the faith with no faith at all. As she was telling me all this, there's no buses, nobody's gonna be able to pick you up, you're not gonna be able to make it. I was smiling at her. Sure enough, a truck came in the distance. They came right to us and stopped, rolled down their window. I'm smiling, of course, she's in shock. The driver of the truck was from Bangkok. They were lost. And he asked me if I could direct him on how to get to the Sun Capri town as they were lost. I said, I will show you if you give me a ride in your truck. They made room for me. I got right in the truck, said goodbye to that Filipino with her mouth wide open, her eyes as big as saucers as she never could have imagined such a thing could have happened as that. But for us, it's normal for God keeps his word. When prayer is your lifestyle, miracles are normal. Praise God. As we went from that village to San Cabri town, and I preached to those in that truck, gave them my testimonies, preached to them. We arrived at exactly 11.30 at that church for me to leave that truck, walk straight to the pulpit, and begin preaching at that church. Praise the Lord. They gave me a small offering, small in the world's eyes, but it was extra for me, so I left it in the envelope knowing this is seed. Sometimes God gives you blessings, sometimes he gives you seed. You have to know which is which, because in order to live by faith, you must sow. You cannot reap unless you sow. As the Bible says, he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully, and he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. God provides seed for us. The next day, as I left San Calabria town in the bus, as the bus was leaving, moving, a man told the guy collecting the money on the bus that he had lost his wallet. That man working the bus picked him up, was gonna throw him out of the moving bus. So I stopped them and said, I'll pay for his ticket. Praise God. The bus worker, not a Christian, then told that man, you need to thank that guy over there for paying for your bus ticket and began yelling him for that. I said, no, he didn't need to thank me. He needs to praise the Lord. As we're driving on from San Calabria back to Canchanabri, I saw that man was still stressed. You see, just giving him enough for the bus wasn't enough. He had lost his wallet. He needed some money. Wherever he was going to, he needed money at that place. So he got to a certain place to use the bathroom. I asked that man, he's still stressed out. Of course, he was nice to me as I paid for his bus ticket. How much money did you lose in your wallet? And sure enough, it was the exact amount I had in that envelope that he given to me at that church. So he told me the amount, I said, well, here it is. And gave him the blessing. He was in shock, almost sort of crying right in front of me, praise the Lord, and couldn't thank me enough. He didn't just need a bus ticket, he needed the money he had lost. Wherever he was going, he needed that money, but God provided, I was able to bless that man with that blessing that he gave to me. How did these things happen? How is it I get preached at a Seventh-day Adventist church? How is it I could pray for the sick and a whole hospital room would empty out? How is it I get to find transportation on a day there was no transportation? Because of faith in God. 
If you covet after money, if you live for money, if money is your desire, if money is the answer to your life, the Bible warns you, you get err from the faith. God had chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith. We desire to live by faith. We desire to have faith in God. We desire to please God. And Christ says, nothing shall be impossible to him that believeth. You may profess to be a Christian. You may even profess to be born again. But do you have faith in God? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Do you have evidence of the unseen God in your life? Are your prayers being answered? Is God's word being fulfilled in your life? Do you have enough faith to give all your money to the poor and follow the Lord? Do you have enough faith to go the opposite way of mammon and go the way of the cross? Do you have enough faith to leave your first world country and all of its comforts and security and to come here to the third world and preach the gospel where it's needed? Do you have faith in God? For without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For you that come unto God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Mark 11, 22, Jesus Christ says, have faith in God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thine house. Have faith in God. God bless you.